Okay, so I, I chose this title um, to bring out the fact that uh, we're not observing optical light. Now, I, I, I suspect actually a lot of what I've got to say is going to be things that many of you are familiar with. Um, uh, but I, I thought I'd go through at a fairly um, uh, sort of general level what goes on in millimeter wave astronomy. Um, and uh, but I am basically a, a techie person, so um, I'm trying to, going to try and leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So if people want to ask more about the technical side of things, uh, then I hope there'll be a chance to do so then. Um, and so let me just say right away, of course, that what I'm talking about here is the dark things in the universe, which are evident in this picture, not, and I'm not talking about dark matter, right? So this is ordinary matter that happens to be dark. It doesn't shine, um, and so we can't see it in the visible. Um, what we can see in the visible are stars, and for very many years, people have made up stories about the patterns of stars in the sky um, and uh, related that to mythology. If you go to Chile, this is a picture of the northern Atacama Desert in Chile, where you see the Andes in the background. Um, it's an amazingly dry place, but it is still populated. There are still rivers that flow down, carrying the, the snow melt from the Andes. And um, there's a lot of wildlife that lives up there in the Andes, in the places where there is some vegetation. This is a vicuna, a relative of obviously a yama, and dist more distantly, a camel. Um, one thing you find there from left over from the ancient civilizations, this is, area has actually been populated for about 10,000 years, are these petroglyphs. And of course, one of the things they draw, their favorite um, hunting and uh, later, I guess, domesticated animals, the yamas. Um, when they look up at the sky in those clear parts of the world where there's really dark skies, it's actually so dark that even when there's no moon, your eyes become so well accustomed you can actually walk around in the desert i've done this just by the light of the of the stars in particular the, the light from the from the milky way and you look up at the milky way and you see all these dark shapes and it it was actually that that attracted the attention of the people the the local people the indigenous people um rather than the patterns of the stars were the interesting shapes they could see in these dark clouds so if you ask the people to tell the stories, um, this is a, an artist's impression of what they see in the Milky Way. So here's a, uh, perhaps I should just check. I hope there's still somebody in line. Can you see my pointer? Yes, we can. Excellent. So you can see very clearly there's a Yama here and there he is up there in the sky on the, in a photograph. And um, there's actually, it's got a little baby with it and so on. And there's all these other shapes here. So the, the Inca constellations in the sky have these names which refer to their things they were familiar with and, and their mythological figures. If we come back to the, you know, the more scientific view of what's going on, when you look at one of these dark clouds uh, with a modest sized telescope, and take a picture, then you, this is an image of what you see. This is one of uh, Bernard's dark nebulae. And it's very obvious looking at a picture like this, that what you've got here, this is happens to be a cloud that is in front of a fairly well populated part of the Milky Way. So there's an incredibly dense background of stars, but you just see that they're completely, the light from those stars is completely blocked out um, where there's this cloud. And that we now know is basically a cloud made of gas. A very diffuse gas, but it's got a lot of dust mixed in with it. Essentially, it's interstellar smog. And it's the dust that blocks out the starlight. And of course, I remind you that the reason stars shine is that they're very hot and the dust doesn't shine because it's very cold. It's out in interstellar space um, and um, it, uh, it cools down to low temperatures. So um, this is, I'm sure, picture that you're very familiar with that shows the whole range of the electromagnetic spectrum and visible light is of course only a very small part of that range electromagnetic waves are all basically the same physics but they characterized by the frequency or the wavelength of the uh, of the oscillations in the electromagnetic fields 
and the visible is in the middle of this plot and then you've got the higher frequencies higher energies on the right lower frequencies on the left and down at the bottom end is radio so of course astronomy started in the visible and then much more recently within the last hundred years or so um, other windows have opened up and we've been able to do astronomy at other wavelengths um, and in fact one of the first of those windows was radio so i'll just do two minutes on radio astronomy because um, i some way do consider myself a radio astronomer um, this is just a picture of our observatory at uh, Lord's Bridge, just outside Cambridge. And the older telescopes there were built back in the 90s and 1950s and 60s. And in those days, radio astronomy was conducted at wavelengths of meters down to maybe a few centimeters. That corresponds to frequencies of about 100 megahertz, which is where, so that's what's called a VHF radio, high frequency. Uh, and then uh, it went up to 2.7 gigahertz, which happens to be about the frequency of a microwave oven. Um, now those telescopes, the important things that were done with those was to pioneer the idea of aperture synthesis, where you combine together the signals from many different antennas um, in order to make an image and to use that technique to discover uh, the, the distant sources giving off these radio signals and to demonstrate that um, what was found was consistent with the Big Bang theory of the universe rather than the steady state theory, which was probably the biggest um, controversy in astronomy in the 1950s uh, through into the 1960s. So in those days, people didn't make images with such telescopes. Um, that hadn't really hadn't had that idea, but they used chart recorders to record the data coming out from an individual telescope. So when they got the process of aperture synthesis working, which of course involves a, a big, a lot of computing. You had to, in those days, there was a computer at Cambridge, the university's computer, and you had to take the data from the telescopes, feed it into the computer. And it actually took months to make um, a, 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 an image like this. Um, but when you'd done all the computations and formed the image, the output was put as if it had been coming out of a strip recorder. So you can see a, it, it's been drawn by lines going across on a, on a, with a pen. At each place where there's emission of radio waves is one of these uh, spikes that sticks up. And it turned out that each of those was a distant galaxy. This was discovered by observing the brightest of them, discovering there was a distant galaxy at that position. And we now know that each of these is in fact a, 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 a galaxy which has got an active nucleus, that's to say a massive black hole in the middle. So this is an optical picture with a galaxy sitting here. The black hole is right in the center. And then there's these jets coming out, which are high energy particles. And these produce when they mix with the surrounding very diffuse gas that produces the radio emission that we see. So each of the objects on here typically is one of these. Now observe, this is a, of course a modern observation now that we've got much higher resolution. And the first thing that people were interested in was the question of uh, how many of, the, of these objects there were and how far away they were. And it was possible to work out that just by looking at the number of them that you saw at different levels of brightness, that in fact the universe had to be evolving. The, 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 this curve shows the number that you find as a function going to fainter and fainter brightness. And it first goes up and then it goes down. And this should have been flat or flat and then going down if the steady state universe had been correct. Um, and so this was the a very strong evidence that the um, steady state was wrong. And the only other viable theory at that time anyway was the so-called Big Bang. So anyway, this is early history of radio astronomy, and that's all I was going to say on that because I wanted to move immediately on then to the extension to higher frequencies. As I said, that um, those observations were made at um, the frequencies that were used for radio communication, in which we still mostly use for radio communication. Um, but I was lucky enough to go to the University of California in the late 60s, and I uh, started working there with um, uh, one of the professors, Professor Jack Welsh, who uh, had decided to build a dish which would work at much higher frequencies. At least in those days, we considered this extremely high frequency 
30 gigahertz, which is about one centimeter wavelength. And you can see here, it, it's actually a 20 foot diameter dish. And the receiving equipment is inside this tube here. You had to climb up this step ladder and sort of wriggle in through the back here to work on it. It was extremely difficult to, uh, <laughs> impractical to use. Um, but nobody really knew what one was going to observe by making a telescope that would work at such wavelengths. Um, so um, uh, there was the general idea that you'd be able to observe at least planets because they are known to give off thermal radiation. Um, but that was really the the main purpose was technological, just to try and to try and do it and see what was there. Um, now it turned out that um, at that same time, Charles Towns, who was the inventor of the laser, had moved to Berkeley, and he uh, was interested in interstellar molecules. It was known that there was gas in the space between the stars, and uh, it was thought, I mean, it was, and that most of that gas, of course, was hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. It was thought that very simple molecules like um, OH and CH, so hydrogen combined with oxygen and carbon might exist because they only involve two atoms, but that there was no chance of ever getting three atoms together because the density was so low. So you wouldn't have any more complicated molecules. Towns thought it was worth a try. And um, he knew there was a, an emission line from ammonia at 23 gigahertz. So he suggested to Jack Welsh that they search for that. And it actually took them months to get a detection, but they did eventually convince themselves that this faint feature you can see on this plot here, this is a plot where they looked at blank sky and they don't see anything. They looked at a particular object. There's actually a uniform amount of emission. That's just general thermal emission. But this line here, and they published that, which was fairly brave, saying, we think this is ammonia. Then they thought, oh, well, not far away, there's a line due to water. And of course, they regretted not having chosen that first, because it turned out, see, this is about one degree of brightness. Um, it, the, the emission is equivalent to having a temperature of about one degree, or no, about half a degree, actually. When they turned to the water line, it was about 60 degrees, and they could have found that instantly. Um, and it turned out that there was actually maser action going on in the water. So this was really, um, you know, a great coup for town. So he'd, he'd, discover, he'd invented lasers and then discovered um, that they uh, could exist in interstellar space as well. The other thing that was remarkable about this water emission is this is a spectral line, um, but you see that the quantity that's plotted across the bottom here is velocity, kilometers per second. And that's because we know what the frequency of the water emission should be. And what you observe is a range of frequencies. And that can only really be due to the Doppler shift so that the water is moving. It, well, it's moving at, at lots of different speeds, some of it coming towards us, some of it going away from us. So something's really violent is happening um, in both uh, causing the water to get into a state where it produces major emission and um, moving around at these high velocities. So. Uh, turned it, this then turned into my project, which was to try and uh, find out where exactly this water emission was arising. Because with a single dish, you can only measure roughly at the position in the sky that it's coming from. So we managed to cobble get together another dish out of an old uh, reflector that had been built for something else and put it on a mount that was made for a different telescope and then joined the two of them together. And with an, that, that forms an interferometer. This is called single baseline interferometry. Essentially what you're doing is measuring the fact that the signals arrive at the two telescopes at slightly different times, just because the speed of light is finite. And if you, if you measure how that time difference changes as the object moves across the sky, you can work out where in the sky it must be really quite accurately. So we were able to pin down the position of these water mazes. You see it's this symbol here. So it's this thing here. Now we knew it was associated with this thing called W3. These are contours actually made with the telescope I showed you a few minutes ago in Cambridge that shows where the main radio emission from this object comes from. But it wasn't, uh, and these were regions that are, are ionized gas that's been created by hot stars. But the, the water was not coming from those regions, but in between here, but there were sources of infrared, so heat radiation coming from those points. Um, and so that was uh, an interesting result. And we realized that 
uh, I mean, obviously there was a lot going on at the time about the whole question of where do stars form and and what do we what can how can we observe them? And it was realised that this is actually a case where we're forming new star where we're seeing new stars being formed. And one of the effects that you get is that the clouds of gas around them, just around that particular point, which contained originally probably ice, the heat from the new star um, boils the water off and it can actually push the water around at high speeds and produce um, this emission. So that was, um, for me, a very uh, uh, interesting and exciting field. Um, and I should just say, um, before leaving the molecules for a moment, that after the discovery of those first two molecules, water and ammonia, a whole slew more were found. There's something well over, well, it must be of order 200 different molecules that are now known. This is a, a later spectrum taken across a much wider range of frequencies. This is gigahertz scale going from 220 to 240 gigahertz, just looking at Orion. And you see all these different lines here. and these are each line is from a certain molecule some some uh, molecules produce a lot of lines so there's a whole group here that's probably methyl alcohol i think um uh, others that just have very simple spectra but this developed into an important field observing these molecules in the interstellar clouds and trying to understand the chemistry that forms them what the implications are for our understanding of, of the rest of astronomy um so the uh, the UK, as I say, that work uh, was originally, I, I was working in California at the time, I came back to Cambridge, and there were other people who were keen to get involved in this field of, of high frequency work, in particular to work on the molecular lines. Um, and, and we needed to do this. So, as I said before, you know, when I started, 30 gigahertz was considered a high frequency, but most of those molecular lines were known to lie up in the region of hundreds of gigahertz. So now you're talking about wavelengths of about one millimeter. So this is why this field is called millimeter wave astronomy. And um, we decided that a, a 15 meter dish able to work at 800 gigahertz would be a good target. Um, and we, did, we worked on the design of that and got the project underway. There was a long period when we were trying to get funding and so on. Eventually the Dutch joined in and then at the time it was actually inaugurated, the Canadians joined as well. And the telescope was called the James Clark Maxwell Telescope. And it's sighted on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, so why Hawaii? Well, um, one of the points about trying to work at these high frequencies is you actually have to get above clouds and also above as much as possible any water vapor in the atmosphere. So at first sight, Hawaii does not seem a promising place to go. It's well known for scenes like this um, and it has some of the highest rainfall in the world. There are places that have 400 inches of rain a year. But um, it turns out that it, it's actually, it, it's got these very high mountains. There's 14,000 foot Mauna Kea here. Um, and the the clouds normally lie between a few thousand and maybe eight or nine thousand feet and above that the air is extremely clear and extremely dry so this is actually a very good site um, for doing this this sort of work it's one of the best sites in the world so this was the selected site and uh, in particular it, it, of course it's already the site where there's a number of um, optical telescopes this was when we first went there. I think there were just these four that you see in this picture. This slightly gives the lie here because it shows a, a cloud up above, but that's only in the middle of the afternoon. The, some clouds do sometimes float up the side of the mountain during the afternoon. Anyway, this was our um, chosen site on this. Uh, it's actually a, an old volcanic cone here, but it's very old as far as we could tell. There hadn't been any activity there for many thousands of years. Um, however, you know, just because the site is usually very dry, it's not always perfect conditions. And you can see that when the construction was due to start, we did have some problems on occasion. Um, that I think is me in the foreground trying to prevent myself getting uh, sunburned and snow blind. Um, eventually, uh, we're talking about 1980s now, we got the foundations built and then a, a, a because the conditions on this site are quite hard at times as i've just shown and because the um telescope had to be very accurate we decided to put it inside a building like you would an optical telescope 
but um, this was the designer building. We it, it turns out for such a big telescope with such a big opening, making a dome isn't very practical. But we were inspired by the local gas holder at Swindon, um, which is where we were having the meetings about how to build this telescope. Um, to uh, choose a building of this uh, general design that you can see here. Um, and so you can see the, the parts for the building arriving and here's the parts for the telescope being installed. Um, and there it is with the surface complete. Now, in fact, it isn't normally in this mode where the sun shines on the dish. That would actually cause it to deform quite badly. Um, we normally operate with this uh, sheet of Gore-Tex in front of the dish which keeps out both the sun and more importantly at nighttime, the wind. But Gore-Tex is almost completely transparent at millimeter wavelengths. Um, so it enables us to observe um, through that. Okay, so jumping back to the spectrum, um, I should just say, well, I should say, of course, that, that uh, JCMT did do a lot of observations of interstellar molecules. So it was successful in, in that sense. But as is the way of these things, it turned out that the most important astronomy that it's done was in other areas. Um, and going back to this spectrum, um, in addition to the fact that you've got the different wavelengths displayed on here and the different frequencies, um, there's also a temperature scale here. And that's because there is a relationship between temperature and the characteristic wavelength that's emitted. So as we know, in order to emit in the visible, you have to be at a temperature of at least a few thousand degrees. Uh, or, yeah, a couple of thousand degrees gets you yellowish light and the sun is about 6,000 degrees for really white light. Um, very high temperatures give you x-rays and low temperatures emit in this region between the infrared and the microwave, which is our millimeter wave domain. So this is important. If there is part, uh, matter in the universe that's cold, we can only observe it directly by going to these wavelengths where it will emit. Um, uh, and so uh, going back to our cloud of cold dust, which I said we can't see, uh, if you actually look with a millimeter wave telescope, you discover there is emission here. Now, excuse the false color. I mean, all those different colors are showing is just different amounts of intensity of millimeter wave emission. But this is a map, in fact, made with JCMT that shows the um, uh, the fact that you see this uh, emission because the, the dust is not completely cold. It's actually probably at temperatures of about 10 or 15 degrees above absolute zero. And that is warm enough to give off uh, emission at a wavelength of about a millimeter. And so one of the things that, that uh, JCMT worked on was mapping out some of these clouds. And you could see that inside the clouds, there are, are actually blobs um, of quite dense regions surrounded by lower density. And um, it, it, these, these blobs, if you estimated how much material there was, it was perhaps a few times the mass of the sun. Um, but it's so cold and so dense, uh, or relatively dense, that it should actually be collapsing under the force of gravity. And so this is the situation you expect that will lead to the formation of new stars. So the whole topic of forming new stars was clearly something that we could study with millimeter waves. Um, and again, though, you can't see very much with a single dish. You just see that these blobs are present. So we, um, again, improvised an interferometer to try and get a slightly better view. Um, and uh, it turned out that there was a Caltech had a, also built a, a millimeter wave telescope next to the JCMT on the mountain here. So we we're able to combine them and measure the fringes. Now with one single baseline, I've explained you can get, get the position. You can also estimate if it turns out the object's about the right size, roughly the size of the object. And if it's elongated in its shape, what its orientation is. So, I mean, if it was cigar, for example, you could tell which way around it was. And so this is an attempt to do that for one particular object in the middle of one of these clouds. Um, it's in Taurus. Um, uh, but this was consistent with the idea that this was indeed a new star and that the gas around it was in the form of a disk. This is the um, uh, predicted form of the disk, this shape here, uh, that was consistent with our data. This is the data shown up above. 
uh, two different views of the data. Um, and so, uh, in fact, uh, other groups were working already to try and develop uh, arrays of submillimeter telescopes. And the first one uh, to be operational at, uh, well, yeah, at wavelengths of about a millimeter um, was built by the Smithsonian Institute and it's next to the other telescopes on Mauna Kea. Um, and with that, this is using eight six meter dishes. Uh, it was possible to make, you know, moderately good images. They still tend to represent them just as contour maps, but you could see that these things were indeed small elongated blobs. Let me just draw attention to the angular scales here. This is about two, four arc seconds across in total. So they're pretty small. You need a lot of resolution. At these wavelengths, of course, you have to have uh, the telescope that you're building by doing your aperture synthesis has to be quite big to get that sort of angular resolution. Now, this um, process of star formation is something that happens everywhere in the universe. And in fact, we know that um, uh, the originally the, ga the universe was made of gas uh, and processes had to take place mostly much earlier than now in the early times of the universe. Um, which converted most of that gas into stars. So that was presumably this same process that we can still see going on in our galaxy today, the process of star formation, but it must have happened on a much grander scale. Um, and the galaxies, uh, young galaxies must have contained a lot of gas and that gas must have been converted into stars. And that would have taken place inside clouds, individual clouds of gas inside those galaxies. And again, most of it then will not, you'll not see light emitted from that process, but you will see infrared and millimeter wave um, signals. And this plot here just shows the energy in the background. That's to say, if you take a large area of sky, subtract off all the stars that are present, anything else, and look at the energy as a function of wavelength. So going across, this is meters out at the furthest end here, um, the optical is over on the left here, well, you've got frequency going across the top. So down the bottom here is the well-known cosmic microwave background, which is simply the heat left over from the Big Bang. And that's the dominant source of background. Over on the left, you've got the optical background, which is the light from the very distant galaxies. There are so many faint galaxies that you won't actually be able to distinguish them. But if you just look a very sensitive detector, you could pick up the optical background. In between is a background that's made up of all the distant galaxies that are forming stars, and they're giving off, they, they have these dust clouds, and they're giving off more or less an equal amount of, of power as there is from all the stars. So in the back, in, in the distant universe, there's about equal amounts of light, of power, sorry, uh, energy, coming from the light of the stars directly and from the light created by the formation of new stars, heating the surrounding clouds of dust and then re-emitting in the far infrared. Um, and it turns out that a wavelength of about one millimeter is ideal for observing those galaxies which are creating those new stars. Um, this is the spectrum of a galaxy near ours um, which has a lot of star formation going on in it. It's a galaxy, I believe it's actually a place where two galaxies are merged. And so the, the gas clouds in them have been shocked into making a lot of stars. And you'll see this, this the peak of this emission is coming out uh, at a frequency, well, a wavelength is easier, of about 100 microns. So now if you take that same spectrum and just say, well, what would we see and this is at a redshift of about 0.3. What would we see if that same galaxy were at a redshift of one? And you see, of course, it gets fainter because it's much further away, uh, but it also shifts to longer wavelength at a redshift of two. It's fainter still, but it's longer wavelengths again, and so on and so on. But if you, instead of just looking at the spectrum, you say, well, let's choose a particular wavelength here. And in particular, let's choose one millimeter, which happens to be right here. There it is then it turns out that all these curves overlap. So as although to start off with, the signal gets fainter, once you move it out past a redshift of about one, 
because you're getting closer and closer to the peak of the emission, the amount of signal you receive is almost the same, even out to a redshift of seven or eight. Um, and so it was this realization, which happened long after JCMT was built, that made people start looking to see if they could see this emission from very distant galaxies. And they were successful. They, there was a, an instrument called SCUBA that was built that could detect um, just the broadband continuum thermal emission and they looked at the Hubble Deep Field because that was a place that, where we knew what, where the galaxies were. And um, uh, they saw there was actually quite strong millimeter emission. It's kind of blurry because it's just done with one telescope, but it's clear there's a lot of places here where there is uh, millimeter wave signals coming. And when they looked at the Hubble image, uh, these did not coincide with the bright galaxies that were nearby. They had to be very distant objects. So um, by now I sort of got to the mid 1990s and at this point it was clear that in order to really pursue this subject, we needed uh, a telescope with a lot more dishes um, to make really good images. They had to have better angular resolution. So they needed to be able to be further apart when we did our synthesis and we needed to be as dry a location as possible. It applies a high altitude. And um, a number of projects were started, one in the US, one in Japan, and one in Europe, um, trying to do this, originally three independent projects. And they all focused on sites in Northern Chile. So I'm gonna do a little digression now, um, just with a bit of a tourist guide to Chile. I hope that's okay. Um, I can, somebody can interrupt if uh, this is uh, too far from the topic. But uh, Chile is really a fascinating place. Um, it's of course well known as being the longest and thinnest country in the world. Um, in fact, if you um, invert the map and put Europe on, exchange the latitude south to north and put Chile on. So in other words, if you flip Chile so it's in the same range of latitude, then the northern part of Chile, which is where the telescopes are, the Atacama Desert is right in the middle of the Sahara the tip, I think, reaches Chad. And then, of course, the what's the southern tip, Tierra del Fuego, is in Scandinavia. So it gives you some idea what a big country it is. It's the only place I've lived where the signposts often have four digits in the numbers telling you how far it is to the next town. Um, so uh, just dividing that up, you've got um, here the, the southern region, which is all uh, icy and, and islands and inlets. Then the uh, Lake District comes north of there. These join, of course, this bit goes up from the top of that bit. Um, and then the Central Valley, which is famous for agriculture, Santiago, the capital, which is where most of the astronomers live. Uh, and then the north of Chile, which is the really dry region where the telescopes are actually located. Um, so here's a picture showing a bit of that southern region taken from the, the air down at uh, water level. Um, the amazing uh, mountains that have been carved by the ice and uh, lots of wildlife of all different sorts. Uh, so moving on swiftly to the, the lakes, this is uh, the monkey puzzle trees that grow in, the, uh, in this region. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, volcanic activity in the mountains there. This is quite an active volcano uh, in amongst uh, some of the lakes there. Um, and then this is the, the wine growing area. It's actually already getting quite dry by the time you're here. Santiago has this backdrop of mountains, which makes it very beautiful if the air is clear. Unfortunately, they trap the smog, so often they can't be seen. As you go further north, it gets very dry. Uh, interesting, there's palm trees actually growing in the interior, um, but it, there's um, a lot of uh, impressive places to visit. When you get really to the north, it's um, true desert. Here, it, it doesn't rain at all in some of these regions. Um, although I say that, and then when you look at the picture, it's perfectly clear that the ground has been shaped entirely by the flow of water. So it has rained at times, at least in the past. Um, and there's still a few uh, living creatures hanging on. Uh, the whole region has been exploited for minerals for many years. So this is the old 
areas where they used to bring in the pot the um nitrates which were used for fertilizer and for uh, ammunition making munitions uh, up until about the time of the first world war um, and uh, things don't decay very uh, rapidly in the desert so the old machinery is still standing around nowadays the big mining industry is copper this is looking down on one of the big copper mines this thing is probably a couple of miles across and maybe uh, 2,000 feet deep or something like that you can't even see the uh, machines that are working down in there but they're there um, parts of the desert do get flowers if it rains and it can be very beautiful there's um, uh, we were lucky enough to actually make a trip after it had rained um, in the southern part of the Atacama um, and the the flowers are a real sight to behold um, but uh, in the north um, the the even if it does rain which it does just occasionally because the clouds come over the mountains um, there's very little that can actually grow um, as I've said at the beginning the the region is populated and in fact the uh, Spanish came here in the 1600s and of course they converted the people their big thing was to convert the people and get them to build churches so they built churches in their local style it's the inside of one of these churches um, and it's very interesting to see the decorations they put up these are originals from the 1600s as far as we know you can see this is a picture of the crucifixion Christ carrying the cross and these are the Roman soldiers accompanying him but of course they've actually dressed them as conquistadors as Spaniards which makes you realize what they thought about the, the local the, about the Spanish okay so that was a brief introduction to Chile um, and now I'm just going to describe Alma um, which uh, uh, your our host already said it has got 66 uh, antennas designed to work up to these very high frequencies and the altitude of the site is 5,000 meters. The amazing thing is that there's nearly 15 kilometers of flat land up on the Andes at that point. Um, the project was a partnership in the end between three major partners, Europe, North America, and East Asia. That's to say the three original projects managed to come together and just all build one together. And each of these partners is actually a consortium in the case of Europe. Uh, there were 14 countries at the time. There are more joined since. North America um, was USA and Canada and bizarre, bizarrely Taiwan. Taiwan also managed to get in as a partner on the East Asian side as well. So that was an interesting maneuvering there. I don't know the details of how that happened. But this uh, construction of this project uh, took most of 10 years from 2000 to 2011 and it cost about a billion pounds depending on exactly how you do the counting so this was only possible because we had got all these countries involved um, so the site as i've said is it well it's on the andes next to the atacama desert it's not strictly in the atacama desert the atacama desert is this region here um, and uh, in fact uh, along the side of it is where because there is snow melt um there is uh people still live and san pedro is a rather um a beautiful ta a little village just um at the foot of the andes well it's already at eight thousand feet altitude um with uh, plenty of vegetation but we didn't want to put our buildings in the in the village and spoil it um so instead we built this uh, base up on the hillside and there's a road that actually leads up between the cones here onto the plateau which is above um, and actually again this is probably a bad advertisement for this site because it does show that, that you do get clouds coming over the site from time to time uh, this is more typical with the clear sky up here um, so this is the operation support facility um, where the astronomers actually live and where the telescopes were put together um, and the uh, data is actually brought to to work on uh, so the telescope the dishes themselves are up on the plateau this is in what's called the close pack configuration this was actually taken before they're complete i think there's about 30 or 40 here but we haven't got the full 66. Um, it turns out that for different types of observations you sometimes want to have all the antennas close together 
Sometimes you want to spread them out. If you want to get the highest resolution, you want to spread them out. But if you want to get the most sensitivity to relatively um, large objects, then you need to bring them together. So they have to be movable. Um, the individual telescopes are 12 meters across um, and they surface accuracy, as I think I mentioned, is um, measured in microns. So this is a serious piece of engineering to make these work. Even more difficult is making them all work together. So we actually have to measure the time. As I explained, what you're doing here is measuring time differences. And that has to be done to a fraction of an oscillation of the wave. So we're talking about um, hundreds of gigahertz here. And that means that you end up measuring the times in femtoseconds. Femtoseconds are 10 to the minus 15 of a second. Um, and that's done by having a central reference system with lasers and sending out um, optical light that's been modulated to carry the time information to the telescopes, sending the light back again and measuring the round trip so you know exactly how long that piece of optical fiber is and it changes with temperature, for example. Um, so that gives you the time at each telescope and then you bring in the signals, you essentially put a timestamp on them, digitize them and send them into the central correlator where you uh, look at the signals coming from the individual telescopes and try to find the part that is correlated because most of what comes back is noise, but you're looking for the part that's come from the distant astronomical source, which will be correlated between the different dishes. This is the correlator, it's a big digital machine, basically just multiplies the numbers together to form the correlation. Um, but it does have to have this very high operational rate. It's 10 to the 17 operations a second is the effective uh, number of multiplications that it's actually doing. Um, the receivers have to be very sensitive, of course, the signals are very weak. So we cool them down to a few degrees above absolute zero. Um, they have a, a helium, refrigerator, which is this unit here. This is the receiver itself, which is inside a vacuum. It just shows a, a diagram of what's inside there. And the actual detectors are mounted. These are blanks. This was one being assembled, but this has got some of the detector systems in. I, I can't, I don't have time to go into the detail of this, but you can see that there's some very elaborate machining here to collect the signals together. And then they're fed into superconducting devices that actually, um, uh, enable you to, uh, in fact, convert the very high frequencies we're observing down to a lower frequency so that you can digitize it and then put it onto the fiber and send it back to the correlator. Um, so as I said, the antennas are, uh, can be clustered together in a compact array, but they can also be spread out across the plateau here and in between the other cones. Um, and uh, this plot just shows the different configurations that are possible. Um, let's see, which way does this go? So this is the biggest scale. And then there's a compact arrangement here. And then you expand that and you see this scale. Compact arrangement here, you expand that, you see this scale. And then the, in addition, there's what we call the compact array, which is a, a set of smaller telescopes that just fits in this square that's configured like this. And these actually are not movable. So. We need, of course, to be able to move the telescopes around. Now, I hope this is going to work, but I've got a little video here that just shows this. Um, here's a telescope up on the transporter. And uh, you can see that it trundles along actually quite a good pace. If you've got to move a couple of telescopes 15 kilometers you can't aff and get them set up and running in a day, uh, you can't afford to hang around. Um, so this is all great fun. Um, and interesting sound effects there. Well, I don't know whether you heard the sound, but um, you got the impression, I hope. Again, this site can have problems. Um, we, we perhaps rather over advertise the fact that it was a very dry site, um, but of course it's on top of the Andes and so it does get snowed on. This is trying to reach the um, switches of the electrical power, but, uh, uh, distribution center in order to be able to turn the power back on again after there's been a snowstorm, which was a bit of an oversight in the choice of location of that uh, switchboard. Um, and it does occasionally also rain. Um, and again, this building, although it was intended to be rainproof, uh, 
turned out the first time it really did rain, um, an awful lot of water came in. Dust storms are another problem. This was an impressive one rolling across the uh, Salar towards the side. Um, okay, I'll just a couple of quick pictures of the uh, dishes being assembled. These are slightly out of order, these slides here, so that you can see the dishes were actually shipped in two halves. These are made entirely of, of carbon fiber, which is um, the best material for making really high frequency telescopes. You've got a, it, 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 the main issue is they've got to um, hold their shape despite winds, sunlight, uh, gravity from different directions. Um, and uh, I don't think this would have been possible without having a, a material that has uh, the good properties of carbon fiber. Um, you can see here the um, dish part being uh, put onto the base. Uh, this, well, the, this is the dish, being, the telescope being assembled at the uh, mid-level facility. And then here's a nice picture of them in operation up at the site, I guess with moonlight. Okay, so what do the results look like? So this was the first really good image we got of a one of these regions where we thought there was a young star and we thought there was a disc around it. In fact, it's that same one I showed a little earlier where I said, you know, our data was consistent with there being an elliptical disc around um, a, a, a single bright object. And this is what Alma shows. And this time we can make a real image. We've got, when you've got enough dishes, you can make a proper image, um, which you don't really have to make any assumptions or fit any models. And what you see is that there's a central object, which of course is the young star. Uh, it's probably got a little bit of dust close into it. And then the rest of the material, dust and gas, is distributed in a disk. But this disk has these very interesting um, dark bands in it, gaps in it, um, which we think is the result almost certainly of the formation of planets. So this is a very young disk and this seems to indicate that at least protoplanets must form really quite early uh, in the evolution of such a, a system, which is probably fairly similar. The, the star that's forming here or has, has just formed has about the same mass of our sun. The scale of this though is quite big. Our whole solar system would be uh, about this size, I think. This is about a hundred astronomical units in, it's about a hundred AU away. So this is one arc second. So about a hundred astronomical units in radius. Um, so uh, it does seem to be a fairly big system, but of course it's known now that the planets tend to migrate inwards after they're formed. So that may, may partly explain what we're seeing here. Um, that one, of course, we're looking at at a tilted angle. That's why it looks elliptical like that. Um, this is this is one that's almost face on. This is a bit closer, so we get down to uh, better resolution. In fact, you're seeing into about one astronomical unit in this central region here. So again, there is another gap immediately around the star, which could be that the planet there are more planets that have actually formed inside this. Um, uh, in a ring here. Um, so that was our the first couple of images that came out on that front. And since then, there have been many more observations of such objects. This is a little collection here that shows that you see different structure. Practically everyone you look at has a different structure. Um, it's not surprising, obviously, slight differences in the circumstances and the history of, of what goes on in a, a, a disk. And the fact that we're looking at them at slightly different times in their evolution um, can probably account for most of the differences. Uh, but it is very striking that some of them are rather smooth. Some of them have these very tight, sharply defined rings. And I think if they're sharply defined as that, it almost certainly means that there is a planet, maybe two planets that are actually acting as essentially shepherds and holding this uh, residual dust in this very well-defined ring. Some of them have, uh, these are probably younger objects that tend to, st that, that the ring, it, it, there's no ring pattern well-defined, but instead you do see hints of spiral structure. And you do expect that if a gas, a, a disk of gas is sufficiently massive, it will form a spiral just the same way as a galaxy has a spiral structure. Um, uh, and this would probably be before the, the formation of planets has really taken place. <clears throat> 
Here's another one where uh, I think there's quite a detailed model that suggests that um, if a planet the mass of Jupiter was orbiting at this around this position and another one about the mass of Neptune out here, then you can explain the configuration of rings, both the bright one here and then these two and even this outer one here, they fit together into a, a dynamical system that's consistent. This is a rather um, impressive uh, image of a, what seems to be a double star being formed. You've clearly got two bright cores and then a much more complex irregular structure of gas around it. Um, but it is possible to construct a dynamical model that shows how the gas might be flowing around if you had two very young stars and uh, remnant gas around them. <clears throat> um, how are we doing for the time now? Probably. Um, um, yeah, we're okay. You can just keep on going. Good. Fine. Um, I've only got a few more slides and then we can go to questions. So you'll remember that I was saying one of the um, topics uh, that really led to people to realize that it was worth building a telescope, a big telescope dedicated to, to doing millimeter astronomy was not just the fact that we could actually look at individual stars being formed in our own galaxy, um, but also that we could detect these distant galaxies and we would be able to that in that way would be able to see basically the processes that lead to the formation of galaxies themselves. Now galaxy formation is a process that we do not observe happening today. Whereas there are individual stars being formed in our galaxy, we can't look out into the space between the galaxies and see, for example, a big cloud of gas and say, oh yes, that's getting ready to form a new galaxy. Nor can you look at some galaxies and say, oh yes, this is a very young galaxy, it's just formed recently. It seems that all the galaxies we see were formed um, at least many billions of years ago, say half the age of the universe ago. So in, in other words, in the first half of the age of the universe. Um, so we know we have to look out to high redshifts if we're going to see the process of galaxy formation. And we know that most of the process of converting the gas that made up the universe originally into stars must have taken place back in those distant times. So we do expect, and as I've already said, there is an, a, a background of emission at millimeter wavelengths um, that seems to have resulted from that process. Um, so we do expect that we should be able to see if we just take a blank region of sky, um, distant galaxies. And this is a relatively recent uh, map made with ALMA. It's quite a small region of sky. This is actually only one arc minute across here. Um, but of course, with ALMA's resolution, you can see if there are individual objects present. And um, they, these little points here are probably mostly just noise, but all the ones that have got the squares around them, they're confident are distant galaxies. And this, of course, region was chosen because it was one that Hubble had worked on, the ultra deep field. Hubble observed this for, I think it's 30,000 seconds or something like that. Many uh, many, many orbits of observation to get a really deep field. And you see lots of galaxies, but most of these galaxies are relatively close by a redshift of less than one. Um, but there are many high redshift objects. The redder ones tend to be high redshift objects. But even then, most of these millimeter gal these galaxies detected with ALMA um, are in blank spots. Some of them have got objects in, but when you look in detail, typically they're not exactly in the same place. So these are galaxies that have got so much dust in them that they give off very little light uh, and they are at these very high redshifts, which makes it difficult to observe in the optical. Um, so here's, a, here's a, an individual ob, uh, galaxy. Um, it's just a, a random example, but it's at a, a redshift of 4.26. In this case, we can measure the redshift because we can see the characteristic lines of various molecules and atoms um, that are in it. Um, and I'm afraid even with ALMA, it's tough going at these very high redshifts. Um, so this is again an, uh, an image that's got a resolution of well below an arc second, but the galaxy isn't much more than a blob. Um, but you can at least um, measure by looking at the spectral lines, you can measure there's a Doppler shift. So well, I remind you, of course, what we're looking at here is not directly starlight, but it's the emission from the dust. But it, it, on top of that emission from the dust, there is also emission from uh, spectral lines. Uh, 
and we can measure the Doppler shift and see that this is rotating just as our own galaxy is. And of course, by measuring the rotation, you can estimate the amount of mass. This one is 72 billion solar masses. So comparable to the mass of our own galaxy, and yet it's already formed. Uh, but that's a mass of gas, by the way, not mass of stars. But all that gas has managed to get together by this early time. This uh, redshift corresponds to an age of only about uh, one and a half billion years since the Big Bang. So about a third of the age of the Earth. That's probably not a very good analogy, but anyway, one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. So it means even at that early stage of the universe, um, clouds of gas had condensed to form these large galaxies. And this is actually now one of the more difficult problems in present cosmology is to understand how it's possible to have assembled such big galaxies so early. And in fact, this now goes back. There are now observations of galaxies which have already formed stars and have a lot of um, uh, and assemble themselves into disks um, at a, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. So I'm going to stop now. Um, just uh, a couple of lines of commentary. Um, I think this development of this field is a good example of how, you know, when you get into science, you've no idea where you're going to end up. You start out doing something that seems interesting, but, you know, relatively small scale maybe, and it turns out that that opens up whole new opportunities and a lot of people get interested in the field. It's really developed um, uh, out of all possible imagination from the time I started in it. Um, and it's been an enormous privilege, of course, to, to, to work in a field like this that's developing so well and has um, had such a lot of good support. Um, there's been a lot of technical difficulties, a lot of practical problems, um, but it has been great fun. And one of the things that's uh, been most fun about it of all is uh, working with a lot of people from around the world, different backgrounds, um, all in a collaborative uh, way to do this.